Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now you may be looking at my face and saying, Jordan, you don't look nearly as pasty as you normally do. What could have possibly happened? Well, I actually just went ahead and got back from Greece. So today's video is gonna be a little bit short just cause I'm on a limited time schedule this week. Uh, now I will say regarding the ancient Greeks, those guys do know how to build a hell of a temple. Uh, I would say they probably took the mentorship thing a little bit far at times though. Uh, so. Hopefully we don't implement every aspect of their society. Nonetheless, like I said, short one today, let's go ahead and talk about Amazon S3. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about S3 in particular, which is a type of object store. So let's start out by quickly introducing that. Now object stores are something that I've spoken about plenty on this channel, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on introducing this or talking about why. We've got plenty of more basic videos uh, in terms of kind of introducing this concept, and I'd recommend watching those if you want to learn about them. But just is, uh, you know, in a variety of systems that we build both in interviews and real life, uh, we have immutable files, right? Big immutable files full of content uh, that we want to write once and then just read many different times over. So, you know, you could in theory use a database for this type of thing, but typically uh, databases are not really meant for storing large content. Uh, typically it's meant for storing data that can be kind of, you know, written and modified at a small granularity. And so that would kind of be, you know, introducing a bunch of extra overhead for storing this type of content and ultimately using the wrong design for doing so. So we have this kind of dedicated, you know, component or technology called an object store specifically for this. In theory, you could use a distributed file system as well, like Hadoop. But the truth is, even Hadoop has a few extra functionalities on top of an object store that make it a little bit less suited for this type of task. At the end of the day, even though a lot of people do store uh, immutable content within Hadoop, uh, at the end of the day, Hadoop can append data to content within a distributed file system. Uh, and as a result, you kind of lose some of the flexibility that object stores use in order to be so scalable and so cheap. Hadoop is also just kind of a, you know, old architecture at this point and doesn't scale out that well in general, but you know, there are newer distributed file systems that try and fix those problems. Cool, and then additionally Hadoop allows you to run computations on data nodes. Uh, that's something that you can't do in an object store. Think of an object store almost as just like a bunch of disks that allow you to store data, but you can't actually get perfect data locality on them. That's decreasingly becoming an issue these days because our networks are getting faster, but again, I'm kind of digressing and rambling here, so let's go ahead and move on. The main examples of object stores that you'll probably hear about these days are going to be S3, which is what we're focusing on here. And then the other major cloud providers, Google and Microsoft, offer ones themselves. A really nice thing about object stores are they're completely managed by the, uh, the cloud provider. You don't have to do anything on your end to scale them out over time. Okay, so let's quickly go over a super high level object store architecture. This is not really something that's publicly exposed by any of these providers, uh, but fortunately Dropbox made an article on their object store that they built in house. Uh, and I think all of them are more or less similar to that. I'm sure it was some internal tweaks between them, but this is pretty much what we can gander about Amazon S3. So basically we've got a client, we've got a dedicated metadata layer over here where the metadata layer is like your typical key value store distributed database. And basically that's really just storing a mapping from uh, a bunch of files to the data nodes that they live on. I call them data node, but who knows what the actual terminology is. And then typically the file name itself you know, the metadata layer is going to be gigantic, right? Because everyone's using the same exact S3 thing. Uh, you know, it's going to do some sort of partitioning on all of those file names. And typically, at least in the case of S3, they kind of imply that they're doing it based on one particular part or prefix of the file name. So that's worth knowing. We'll touch upon what that means in a little bit. But basically the idea is, again, this is just a partitioned key value store right here to tell us which one of these particular disks or nodes a particular uh, file lives on. Now, these aren't so simple as to just be normal hard drives. There's typically some specialized hardware being used there, maybe some abnormal disks in order to make this stuff as cheap as humanly possible. And additionally, you know, if we were just storing files and we wanted to ensure that they're redundant and replicated, uh, you know, we would use normal replication, right? So if I have a file, maybe I'd replicate it in one or two other places in order to ensure that it's fault tolerant. Because this data is immutable, we can do something here known as erasure coding, which again, I'm not gonna touch upon too much in this video because it's not that important. But the high level concept is this. If I have a file, I can split it into two parts, A and B. In reality, we'd split it into more than two parts. And if I have A and I have B, and I you know, make sure that I have those on these disks over here, I can now also create a separate file 
which is the result of taking A in binary and B in binary and taking the exclusive OR operation between them. The reason being, I know that if A goes down for some reason or we lose it, I can use B and A XOR B and take the XOR of those two files in order to recreate A. So what this basically means is that, you know, because A and B are only half the file, I'm, I'm storing A XOR B, now in total I have 1.5x the amount of data, except I'm able to tolerate one failure. So that's more efficient compared to just, you know, storing one replica of the file. Now it's worth noting that in order to actually read the data, it's a little bit slower, uh, but the point of something like S3 is not to be super low latency, but rather to be super cheap to store a ton of immutable files. The data itself is going to be stored in many different availability zones. Now there's a big distinction here between availability zones and regions. Availability zones are different data centers within the same general region that are relatively low latency to one another. But if you want to have this data living in multiple regions, then typically you have to enable cross-region replication and then S3 is going to start to get a bit more expensive. So what's an example usage of an object store like S3? Well, one particular system design problem that is pretty simple that we talk about a lot is paste bin. So the idea of paste bin is you make a paste, right, where a paste is just a bunch of text content, and it could be a ton of text content, right? It could be even as much as gigabytes. So for example, in this case, you know, what the client is going to do is they take their paste, they upload it directly to S3, this is going to require something known as a pre-signed URL, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then after we upload the data itself to S3, we want to add some sort of metadata row to some sort of metadata database in our own application. The reason being that we want to be able to quickly figure out, oh, you know, for a given URL, pastebin.com slash ABC, here's the S3 link of the actual paste content itself so that then a client that needs to fetch that can go ahead and do so directly from S3. Uh, the idea here is to basically ensure that you're separating your data from your metadata. Metadata should not be living in S3 itself. Okay, in terms of the consistency model of S3, this has not always been the case, but S3 actually supports strong consistency now. Meaning that if I'm, you know, a client over here and I'm writing Jordan equals cute, and then someone else reads right after that's done, right? So this is uh, the response from the client, and this is the request. Basically, the idea is that any read that occurs after that is going to read the up-to-date data. That being said, if I have two concurrent writes, where concurrency just means you know the request and the reply for those clients uh, from S3 is interleaved, you know maybe S3 actually handles this one here and it handles this one over here, and then you don't actually know whether the eventual value of Jordan is going to be hot or ugly. Now keep in mind this is also an oversimplification. In S3 you're not writing key value pairs, but the idea is that you know, you're writing a single file at a time, and each file is associated with a given key, where the key is the path name of the file. Cool. So now we're going to talk about maximizing performance with S3. I think this is something uh, that I actually did not really know so well before looking into this video, and uh, is important to specify because there are some interesting things here. So we're gonna cover a bunch of these different topics over here. This one I'm gonna leave for a separate video, uh, specifically using a CDN, just because I think uh, that is kind of its own topic. Cool, so the first we already kind of mentioned, which is going to be this idea of pre-signed URLs. So if I'm a client and I have a bunch of data locally, right, maybe I've got a five gigabyte file and it needs to get uploaded to S3, one option would be to you know have the server first take in that file and then upload it to S3, right? Because at the end of the day, um, S3 is in the cloud, you need certain permissions to write to an S3 bucket in order to put a file in there. And so the server is going to be you know, configured and bootstrapped with those permissions and so it can do that. However, that's overly expensive, right? Because then you know, if I have another client here, he has to do the same thing and now the server is using a bunch of network bandwidth. It would be a lot more efficient if the client itself could just go ahead and interact with S3. And that's what you can actually do with this concept of pre-signed URLs. So basically, in this idea, uh, a server can first return a URL back to a client, which with it kind of includes uh, authentication permissions. And then when the client uses that URL, it enables them to temporarily uh, either upload or download data corresponding to a file path in S3. I keep saying this term file path, it's really more like a file name. There are no file paths in S3 because it's not a distributed file system. But the idea is this is going to temporarily, until that signed URL expires, allow the client to uh, you know, directly interact with S3. 
Number two is this idea of multi-part uploads. So basically in S3 we can upload five gigabyte files with a normal put operation, but that being said, sometimes you've got bigger files than that and you wanna be able to upload more data. So in this case, we now have multi-part uploads, which can upload up to five terabytes of data. So they actually recommend on the official documentation that any file over 100 megabytes, you should probably use multi-part uploads because you actually get a variety of benefits from doing so. So we're gonna go ahead and describe those now. For starters, uh, you can parallelize the upload, right? I, if I have uh, you know, many of these different chunks of the file living on different physical data nodes, then what that means is that I would rather uh, you know, be using multiple different threads to write data to all of those data nodes rather than sequentially doing so. Number two is that you know, maybe I've got 100 different trunks, chunks to write and I've written 25 of them. I can actually pause that upload, you know, do nothing, and then resume it and upload the remaining 75. Whereas if I were trying to uh, you know, upload an entire file all at once and I get halfway through and you know, the process crashes for some reason, I can't actually resume that. And then finally, I can now even upload content as it's being created. If I have some sort of process on the client that's gradually creating new data, uh, and I want to upload that a little bit at a time so that I can get it done as quickly as possible, uh, this is going to allow us to do that. So what does the actual API look like for multi-part uploads? Basically, the idea here is that S3 is going to first return an upload ID, right? So that you've got three requests to make to S3. The first is to initialize it, you get this uh, upload ID back, and then subsequently you can upload every single chunk using that upload ID and providing a sequence number corresponding to the chunk. Every time you upload a chunk, S3 is gonna come back to you with the checksum, the reason being that the checksum can be used to validate the data. That way, now that we have this checksum, we can go ahead and finalize the request by providing all of those checksums from the prior step and assuming those all look correct on the server side, AKA on Amazon side, they're going to basically say this was successful, uh, you're good to go here. Okay, the last thing to talk about is, or not the last thing, but another thing to talk about is prefix partitioning. So even though S3 is not a distributed file system and there isn't really this concept of you know, distributed files and directories and all that in S3, I mean, there is nowadays, but it's, it's really not the main way of using it. Um, you can actually still you know, just logically organize your data using paths, right? So A slash B slash C slash data dot TXT. That being said, um, you know, in the background, S3 is actually looking at all the requests that you're issuing uh, because at the end of the day, the metadata layer is probably going to be the bottleneck in terms of how many requests can be served. So in the background, it's basically repartitioning that metadata layer according to these actual uh, you know, prefix paths in a way such that they can try and uh, you know, hit the following SLA. They want you to be able to perform 3,500 of these put or delete operations or 5,500 get uh, operations per second per partitioned Amazon S3 prefix. So what that means is that if you're seeing that you're not actually getting the throughput that you want uh, when it comes to using S3, you can actually think about how you might want to restructure your file names such that S3 can better organize that metadata there. Another thing to note is this concept of multiple client connections. You might be thinking, oh, you know, I've got one connection to S3, I'm gonna upload content and I'm gonna download content. In reality, you can speed things up through parallelization, right? On a single client, we just mentioned before how you can use multi-part uploads to basically put a variety of different chunks in a variety of different places. And then similarly, when reading different files, uh, you know, if it was a multi-part upload, you can actually read uh, parts of that multi-part upload at a time, or, you can even just uh, fetch certain byte ranges of a particular file. This means that you know not only is it the case that if I only care about certain bytes of a file, I only have to read those and it's gonna be faster, it also means that I can spin up multiple different threads, read multiple different byte ranges, and then uh, you know aggregate those together on the client. Okay, another thing that I wanna talk about here that I think is probably not talked about often enough is the actual pricing of using S3. The reason I think this is important is because many people in practice make design decisions based on minimizing your S3 bill. I think it's something that doesn't get touched upon enough in systems design interviews because you know when you don't care about pricing, you can do all of these things that companies in practice rarely do. Uh, and I think touching upon pricing will make a lot more sense why certain distributed systems are designed the way they are. So number one is that obviously you're gonna get charged per gigabyte of data stored. At the end of the day, this is a storage solution. And if you're dumping a ton of data in there, you're gonna get charged for it. Number two, which is worth noting, is that you should see that put, copy, post, and list requests are about an order of magnitude more expensive than get requests. 
I think that's worth noting because again, the concept here is to write fairly infrequently but read a ton of data. And so as a result, they don't want gets to be too expensive. Number two is that it is, or the next thing is that it's always free to transfer data into AWS S3 regardless of where it's from. It could be from my local client, which is like my cell phone or my laptop or anything like that. That's totally fine. It doesn't only have to be from an EC2 instance to be free. It's worth noting, that being said, recall that AWS S3 is a regional service. So actually, uh, you know, transferring data out of it to other AWS regions is going to be expensive. This is worth noting if you want to make some sort of service that is resilient across multiple different AWS regions, you're going to have to pay a pretty big premium for that. Another thing is that if you want to download data to the open internet, right, so if we're talking about taking data and putting it directly on a client device, you're going to pay a lot of money for that. So maybe in reality, what that often means is that as opposed to having clients directly reading from S3, maybe a lot of the times you'll have servers which are located in uh, AWS EC2 instances, reading the data first, filtering it down as much as humanly possible, and then sending only the relevant results back to clients. That way it's going to be a lot cheaper. So that's where I you know, say these kind of uh, pricing decisions or pricing parameters make certain design decisions a lot more apparent. Uh, finally, there are also just going to be multiple tiers of S3 storage. You may have heard of Glacier, for example. Sometimes you just want to archive data. You need it there for compliance reasons or just because you really don't expect to access it very often at all, but you still need to have it in general. And so you can charge uh, or you can pay a lot less money for super slow storage. Cool. In conclusion, uh, if you have big immutable files uh, and you need to store them and kind of access them as immutable data, you're not changing them, but they just need to get read back eventually, then something like an object store could be really good to go. You may be thinking, oh, this is only going to be something like Pastebin, right? But this could be static content on a website. It could be parquet files that you're using in a data warehouse or a data lake. There are a variety of different things that you might want to store in S3 in reality. And so ultimately, it is a very versatile solution. It's also really nice that from a user perspective, it's infinitely scalable and it's super duper cheap. That being said, while Amazon doesn't make the design of this service completely publicly known, they do actually hint at a lot of things you can do to improve the performance here. And because we know how certain other object storage solutions work, for example, Magic Pocket with Dropbox, you can kind of start to think about a little bit what we can do on our end in order to maximize performance when using S3. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, sorry if it's a little bit last minute and uh, I'm struggling a little bit here, but I will see you in the next one.